and uh, we're presenting here today on an aspect of Amy's doctoral uh, research which uh, was uh, undertaken at the University of Dundee, uh, which is why I'm involved as well. And what we're looking at is uh, aspects of how everyday practices of walking and encounter uh, can potentially offer ways to challenge perceptions about the landscape. In the landscape tradition, perhaps, landscape is associated with being uh, visual at times to the exclusion of other ex sensory and emotional experiences. Rose and Wiley, 2006, also describe it as a concept of tension with questions about place and the objectivity or connection of people to landscape central to such tensions. Here we explore the role of movement as a as one way of examining the relationship between people and landscape with a focus on what Wiley in 2007 describes as the everyday textures of landscape. In this case, uh, namely the practices of walking and working with and within the landscape. Here we seek to embed the visual uh, aspect of landscape within uh, the body and the mind to highlight how the visual is entangled with things like smells, noise, touch, taste, memory, culture, nature, and so on. Thus, we're embedding the visual within a more holistic, perhaps immersive sensory experience, and in turn highlighting what we're calling here the more than visual qualities of landscape. So we'll just begin by contextualizing this within Amy's uh, wider PhD research. We're from geography, so there's a map. <laughs> just got to be. The PhD involved a wider project exploring how local residents, visitors and landscape managers valued the landscapes of two study areas in the northwest highlands of Scotland, uh, the Applecross Peninsula and Athens, which you can see up there. Both are designated nationally for their aesthetic and wild characteristics as national scenic areas and wildland areas. The wider research used a range of uh, methods, including arts-based ones, although we're not talking about those today, but here we draw specifically on the use of embodied methods, particularly but not limited to walking, in order to explore the fluidity of landscape as a concept and the role of aspects such as individual and shared histories or encounters with the materiality of place. The option of walking was presented to participants as a basic approach that they could and did choose, uh, and other forms of encounter were also possible. Sitting at a favourite spot outside, sitting inside their home looking out, sitting in their place of work, on a boat out at sea, all of these were aspects that were included. The semi-participatory nature of the research meant it was important to allow participants to choose different encounters, especially if health was a factor limiting their opportunity for walking. Participants also chose the length and route of the walk, for some, it was one they did regularly, often starting at their home. Some chose a route with particular significance, a family connection to a particular place or feature, and some took the opportunity to walk a route they had not done before. Walking was therefore both a deliberative act and, for many, something they engaged with on a daily basis. The purpose of undertaking walking interviews was therefore to highlight the role of the more than visual experiences of landscape. This is not to say that walking necessarily yields an embodied response to landscape, but it did provide an opportunity to share an experience with the research participants within, within these places. And Amy will give you lots more examples of that now. There's a little video to go along with this, and there is some noises that will happen in the background. She says. Sorry, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Oh, right, great, thank you. So it starts with a step and then another step and another that I don't like taps on a drum to a rhythm, the rhythm of walking. I want to start by identifying the movement and rhythm that can be created through the practice of walking as described by the quotation by Rebecca Solnit. This video starts with three minutes of a walk I did by myself in Ascent. On this walk I want to see where my eyes were looking. I just used a camera and held it in front of me. This was inspired by a walk I did in Applecross with a mother and a daughter. The daughter was around 10 years old and she suggested that when you walk you very rarely look up at the landscape. 
She felt that you need to be careful about where you put your feet so you don't trip over. She identified that walking can often stop you from looking out there onto a landscape, but instead be more aware of the surroundings immediately around you, and so you don't fall over. Furthermore, walking makes you more aware of your whole body within the landscape and how it is moving through it. Walking has gained greater prominence with social science research as a methodological tool to explore the relationships between people and landscapes. The process and performance of walking has been a means to explore the more embodied relationship between people and landscape. It highlights a more entangled relationship, one where the visual is embedded with a more sensory and embodied encounter with landscapes. O'Neill and Hubbard have similarly described walking as having the potential for emerging sensuous kinesthetic experiences, linking the senses with the act of movement. Ingold in 2006 described a meshwork within which people are threading their own paths and contribute to its ever-evolving weave. This more immersive perspective challenges an assumption that landscapes are distant objects to be looked upon, as suggested by the daughter of the walking apple box. When walking, bodies respond, react, and engage with the landscape. Landscapes can have a physical obstacles that had to be dealt with, such as a bumpy track, a branch that tangles people, including my own hair, or a river that needs to be crossed. Tilly and Bennett argue that the body is constantly opening out itself to the world as it moves in it. Consequently, the body reacts, adjusts, and responds to the obstacle that may be there. There is a sense of learning and knowing the landscape and a personal physical presence within the landscape through being outside in it, as described in the following quotation by Jason, a local resident of Ascent. You have to watch your head and dodge around a little bit. You have to be careful not to poke an eye out. I'm always bumping my head because now that I've got so little hair, um, it's a real challenge, but no, you're very conscious of the environment as you walk around, around it like this. Jason was more aware of where his body was in relation to what was in the landscape, and also conscious of the landscape itself and how he interacted with it. For many, walking was a way to know and get to know the landscape as they needed to respond to it or deal with obstacles that arose. There is also a sense of sociability to walking. Participants reflected that although some conversations had on walks may be regarded as meaningless, it is the act of walking and the movement of walking um, and being in the environment where there are no other distractions that can allow people to resolve difficult situations, problems, or simply just create new stories. Consequently, family and social ties are perceived to be strengthened. The process of walking, instead of acting as a potential physical hindrance to interaction with fellow walkers, can help to facilitate interaction. In Golden begins to argue that walking is itself a way of thinking and feeling, and therefore it is the practice of walking and not just what is being seen that allows people to know the landscape. As mentioned previously, landscapes are traditionally associated with the visual. Large scenes such as this uh, reflect traditional compositional patterns of landscape representations. They are generally large scale and show a wider scene incorporating elements of distant hills, water, and interest in the foreground. However, when this image was sent to me, it was described by Amber as peaceful and dramatic. This suggested a more immersive experience that was had in the landscape, and this photograph was a representation not only of the landscape, but the experience within it. Walking and being in the landscape highlighted the different scales of landscape. Again, this is a larger landscape scene that was taken on a walk with Aidan. Participants would become more aware of what was in the landscape, sometimes stopping the walk to listen to a particular bird that they had heard. One participant described that it was knowing that landscapes are stuffed with all these things and sharing landscapes with them. What was living within them uh, was important for them. There were a number of times that Aidan stopped on the walk. He pointed out and listened for a bird call, including cuckoos, and at the end of the walk, he took an image of this frog spawn. The walk was at the turning of spring, with men, which many of these were signalling. It highlighted a more intimate knowledge of the landscape, but also other senses, namely sound that he was using whilst at walking. It is not, not just what is seen, but also what is felt during his experiences when within the landscape. Beverly described his painting tree, which he had completed and walked in the autumn. You squelch across and you come to a gully, and that was at the beginning of the gully. I sat in the middle of the little stream and did a sketch. It was autumn, the clocks had just gone back after I sketched it, and I went further on up the hills. Then I'm getting my sandwiches, and it's quarter past three, and I'm thinking, oh my god, it's going to get dark, I need to leave. The following video similarly picks up on a more sensory immersion within the landscape. Jenny wished to pick up on the sounds and movement of the water within the landscape that she valued the most. There was a sense of discovery described by some participants, such as a quotation by Verity, who said, discovering and the feeling like it's yours. You know that somebody's built the path and people have been there before, but you tell yourself, nobody's been here for ages. And you're discovering this secret place and you get there and there's nobody else there and you do feel like you found it. 
Verity recognised someone have, else having been there before, but it's a feeling of discovery of some secret place that is particularly valued by her. There is a sense of multiple temporalities within the landscape, of Verity's present and the landscape's past inhabitants, being interconnected, echoing the multiple threads of Ingold meshwork. For Verity and other participants, there was a reflection on the literal creation of roots through the landscape by those who have inhabited it, both human and non-human, such as deer and sheep in the past and present creating roots that are continually used. The dynamic understanding of this performative and transformative relationship between people and landscape is a form of reciprocal existence, I would argue, and therefore the landscape can only can be an equal partner in this relationship, a theme I will we'll return to later. History within the landscape can be at a personal level as well as broader in social history. Often whilst on the walk, there would be something that would trigger a memory for participants, whether it was a particular location along the river, or a smell that reminded them of their childhood, or a particular flower, such as this drawing. Jasmine drew these marsh marigolds after taking me on a walk. During the walk, we came across an area that the children used to play and build dens. She felt a personal connection to the place, but also described that during the spring, the area was covered in these marigolds. Memories can provide meaning to places, as well as a connection to the landscape. I will return to the role of personal memory later, but I want to briefly discuss the role of history and evidence in history within the landscape. Walking can be a way of connecting people to the landscape and the people within the landscape, as seen in this quotation, quotation by Diana, who described the history of the area is quite intertwined. Some of the walks, it's always that thought that was people's route, the people that we knew that lived here all their life. That was the route they went to school on, and the fact that the children would do it a few times a day, I really like that. There are lots of ruined houses from the clearances and then also from TB. You also get a feeling not only as a natural landscape, but also how people have lived here and sort of some of the history. Walking the route that may have been used daily by children to school was a way of connecting Diana to the past. This again echoes the notion of mesh work with multiple temporal routes within the landscape, connecting past with present and the potential for future experiences. There is also material evidence of the past within these landscapes. Here is an image of Runrick system with an ascent. Evidence like this within the landscape would highlight how the areas once had a much larger population and the landscapes were used and worked differently. Again, here is an image taken by Natalie, a local resident in Applecross. She particularly felt that the evidence of old Runricks showed how the landscape was not being used to its full potential as it once had been. In contrast, there is also evidence in the landscape of past practices still being used, such as this image of hair drying on a fence in Applecross. For Patrick, there was evidence of past traditional skills still being utilised and practised to manage the landscape. The focus on being outside can thus identify wider debates on landscape management and the cultural significance of management practices. Some participants described their own working of the landscape, in particular those that owned crops. This image here is of tapestries created by Joy, a local resident of Applecross. The plants that grew on the croft and wider landscape helped a creative practice of tapestry weaving, using wool that she had dyed with plants from the croft. Within this work, she wished to hide the layers within the landscape, the underlying earth and the rock affecting what was happening on the surface of the land. The importance of muscular and tactile engagement with the landscape through walking, working, and being within it allowed not only an engagement with the active present, but also the knowledge of past individuals who have done the same activities. The repeated movements and performances within the landscape created connections between participants and the landscapes that had been walked in and worked. Embedded within these discussions of encounters with landscapes is an emotional response to the landscape. These emotions can largely be associated with a sense of belonging, <coughs> personal connectedness to landscape, and memories of past experiences, as well as a sense of well-being through the therapeutic nature of experiences with the landscape. This quotation by Vincent highlights his family connection to the landscape. The slab, rock, the, sorry, the slab of black rock is Eaton Dew, Little Black Waterfall, and this was a sort of psychological or metaphysical boundary to the township for my granny. She said this was haunted, that's what her sisters and playmates were told, so they never come past here, they wouldn't stray outside the confines of what their parents thought were comfortable. So this slab of black rock was my granny, granny's babysitter. Stopping during the walk to tell me the story of his granny's babysitter, he could point out the particular rock and where it was in relation to his granny's old house. The rock itself was a key actor in this story. Its material and immaterial presence was enough to stop his granny from moving beyond a certain point. For Vincent, it made the landscape feel alive with his own family history and connections to the land. Lee and Ingold argue that walking can result in a double awareness, firstly for perceiving the surroundings in more detail, as demonstrated previously, but also by turning inwards to the realm of thought and the self. The image here is of a coastal landscape in Ascent that one participant described helped her get well again. She had an illness that meant spending time in hospital and taking her away from the area. 
When she returned home, it was small walking milestones within the landscape and getting back to her favorite spot that were her own internal milestones for getting better. There is potential for these discussions to have an emphasis on people, or that landscapes can only exist if they are understood, understood by people. Within these more temporal discussions, there is an underlying tension of landscapes not changing. Yet for some participants, there was a sense of the landscape or the features within it, having their own level of agency with, within the relationship. For example, East and Do in the previous quotation. The rock in this image was taken on a walk with a participant who described it as his wife's rock, and he named it after her as it was where they would both go and bird watch. The rock was equally important in that relationship. For many of the participants of this study, there was a strong sense of belonging in relation to the landscape, as seen in this quotation by De Dennis, who stated, it's just who you are. It's like a fisherman in the sea, it's their environment. They're in their home territory. When we're on the land, we're in our environment. You never take that out of a person, I don't think it will go with you to the grave. This feeling was particularly true for those participants that were from the case study areas, had family from the areas and or had visited the landscapes repeatedly, although not always that, that, that way. <coughs> for many, the sense of belonging with the landscape was through a feeling of knowing the landscape. The landscape or the sea, therefore, although shaped by people, can also shape people and become part of who they are, again reflecting a kind of reciprocal relationship or reciprocal existence between people and the landscape. There are multiple ways through which the landscape can be experienced and encountered. This diagram identifies the multiple experiences that collectively, collectively contribute to a wider landscape experience, the embodied, the emotion, and the uh, visual. Although this paper is primarily focused on the embodied and the emotional experience of the landscape, visual experiences, as probably was demonstrated by that video, do still underlie these discussions, but are part of the wider, more than visual approach that is being advocated in this present, well, here and in my research. Embedded within the experience are the concepts of time and temporality. Experiences can be influenced by previous exper personal experiences or memories and shared history, as well as the material landscape itself and the changes that may occur within that material landscape. There is also um, a circle for culture, but I think that's a whole presentation on itself and something that has been mentioned. So if anyone has any questions about that, I'm more than happy to. Um, but it's kind of picking up on that visual tradition that I mentioned at the beginning of um, the video and how landscapes may be composed, as well as other kind of oral traditions of how people understand landscape. As you can see, there are a number of feedback loops there they are, <laughs> uh, that collectively contribute to to and shape how landscapes may be experienced. And also how, through time, they may help inform future landscape experiences. I don't want to be kind of restricted to now and the past, but also the potential for the future. The reflections discussed here have highlighted the temporality within landscape, the subtle lines of movement, in particular from a human perspective. From the perspective of landscape change and material change within the landscape, these lines of movement or further threads of the meshwork are often imperceptibly noticed. For example, long-term geological processes, or in contrast, they can also be cyclical patterns within the landscape that become something that are relied upon by people. For example, the seasons, tidal movements, and weather patterns. Also highlighting the connection between land, sea, and sky. These patterns can have a continuity which for some participants created a better sense of knowing the landscape and of having a deeper, more intimate connection with it. There are also the shared and personal histories associated with the landscapes that can shape how landscapes are experienced. Knowledge of the people's history of the landscape can also contribute to a sense of knowing the landscape and feeling connected to it. Walking and other experiences of being outside can thus help to challenge how landscapes are perceived, but also explore the relationship between people and landscapes deeper and on a more personal level. Movement through landscapes can transform landscape from an objective material entity out there that is looked upon to something that is far more fluid and immersed within. When discussing landscape, it can often be embedded with layers of history and stories or memories. These can be at multiple levels, from personal to local to national. The image here is a photograph sent to me by Lois, a local resident of Ascent. She described the image as, it caught my attention as a one-off amazing sight, though sometimes some images are not meant to be recorded except in your memory. It was a magic coincidence, unique, never to happen again. It reminds me of a ribcage of the remains of what is left. Here, Lois suggests that despite feeling compelled to take the image and capture this moment, there is also a sense that some moments should only be captured as memories and held by the person. 
This reflection on memory suggests that landscape experience can be carried within people through their memories, but do not necessarily need to be externally recorded. They remain within people, informing and shaping future experiences and perceptions of landscapes of place and spaces. This is my last bit, I promise. The aim of this paper was to explore and examine the concept of landscape in relation to everyday performances and movements through and within landscapes. Experience of being outside can challenge assumptions and perceptions of what landscapes are. Landscape becomes a more fluid, immersive and embodied concept, always being remade and reacted to. Landscapes can be embedded with time as well as personal and shared experiences. History and heritage within the landscape, whether tangible or intangible, can influence how landscapes are experienced and known. Routes and pathways trails can often be those that were used in the past, such as the school. The use of them in the present can be a means through which people today can feel connected to the landscape. For some, there was a sense that through knowing the history of the landscapes and how they have been lived in, landscapes can become more alive. Yet despite this, it is important not to begin to set up a new dichotomy that landscapes are only known by being given meaning by people. As highlighted, the landscape itself can be an agent in this entangled set of processes. These discussions around heritage, history and landscape highlight a potential challenge for the management and development within these landscapes. The areas of Applecross and Ascent as mentioned by Fiona, have been designated uh, for their kind of aesthetic and wild characteristics at a national level. Yet these landscapes are lived in and everyday landscapes, particularly for those who live and work within them. In relation to the management of the land, that this has led to tensions around how it should be managed, what and who it should be managed for, and I promise this is my last point. In discussions of history and heritage, Owen Jones has cautioned that there is a potential to privilege a particular history and so create certain constructs of identity at a personal and national level. Walking and being outside is a useful methodological tool to allow participants to begin to challenge and engage with their own assumptions, perceptions and understandings of landscape, heritage and culture. Further work into landscape experiences in different landscape contexts through a performative methodolo methodology could help to provide further insight into the wider cultural significance of the landscapes and how this may be translated into landscape management practices. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.